I didn't like that too much. And Jimmy Varnell, before we had any connection, called me Fido at the beginning of that 15-minute recess. And I took a swing at him, and we, you know, went around like this, and the recess was just 15 minutes, and I was sure glad. He said later that he was. I said, Jimmy, he became the best boxer in the high school. I said, well, why in the world didn't you just box me, man? You could have boxed my ears off. He said, Easter, listen. And by that time, I named Easter. He said, if, if that haymaker had landed, I couldn't have boxed anybody. But I fought over that name. And when you fight over a nickname, you got it. So I was five, five. And I flunked the sixth grade. We would go down to uh, Jack's Branch. There was a big hole down there. M.J. Ganan's father, Gene Ganan, I think his name, ran that little store that Irvin Edwards later uh, owned. Uh, and uh, the, uh, but anyway, uh, we'd smoke cigarettes. MD would get some cigarettes from his daddy's store. And we'd go down and share those cigarettes. And I, if there was nothing but a butt left, we'd do it. And we were supposed to be home helping our father pick that cotton that we needed to get some clothes. But, and I just horsed around. I was cheating on exams everywhere. I put some on my sleeve. And sometimes I couldn't remember where the answer was. And I flunked the sixth grade. Well, now, you've seen a picture of Athens with the world on his shoulder. You think that's heavy? You ain't never carried a report card home, said, retained in the sixth grade. I had to kick that thing, walk two and a half miles. And I was ashamed of myself. And I was a whole hand, didn't have to bother with mules much back then. And I looked up in the clouds, and I didn't know exactly where God was. But I said, Lord, now I've nearly passed the sixth grade. And I don't need to cheat anymore. If you'll help me, I'm going to quit cheating and start studying. And sure enough, now my Uncle David, second year, my great uncle, was county school superintendent. I'd never heard of him giving any test before, but he came in and gave that sixth grade that I was repeating. He gave us all a test. And it was just, I don't know what kind of test it was, it wasn't much to it. But after that test, he went to my father and said, Frank, he said, Ernest can learn. You spend some time with him. And so the first time I remember Papa helping me, I had a problem that I had to solve. He said, what's the problem? And I read it out of the book. He said, now give me the book. And uh, I said, well, I, I didn't know. He said, well, he gave me the book back. He said, now you read it enough that you can tell me what the problem is. And of course, if you know what the problem is, you're on second base. So I began to study, and when I got into seventh grade, I was exempt on everything except English. And I don't know if you picked up why I wasn't exempt on English yet, because sometimes I say me when I should say I. And think. But then when I got into eighth grade, I was still five. And I didn't like that a bit. But nothing you can do about it. Because you can't fight everybody in the school. Or you might try. But I was in that fighting mood. But I went to Mr. Elias' class and in the eighth grade and he gave everybody a, a problem that was just too tough. Boo Sticky, who was the valedictorian, Brown L. Whiteman, and all the Lucy Grace Calhoun, all of them had sense enough to sit down. It was just too tough. And Mr. Elliott, I was still up there struggling away. He said, hurry up, Easter, Christmas is coming. <laughs> and I didn't pay much attention. But that time I sold the thing and I worked it. And I was proud, and he was proud, but the class was a little jealous. But that day at recess, we were playing basketball, and Coley Rome was under the goal. He said, shoot it to me, Easter. And so ever since then, that's been my nickname. But it sure is a big improvement over Houston <laughs> and Fido. Now, my brother was called Brown Mule. How did he get the name of Brown Mule? It sure wasn't because he chewed tobacco. Because my father never let us buy his tobacco, but one time he was out and he, he let us bring him some tobacco back. Well, you know how curious boys are. We'd seen my father chew it, and we peeled us off a little bit. He didn't cut it off, just peeled off some things. And I took me some, and he took him some. We began to feel sort of funny. 
And we went way up in the house, under the house, the high house, and my mother told my papa what had happened. He said, boys, what you doing under there? He said, nothing. He said, well, come on out. I want to talk to you. And we were so giddy, you know. But he went out. He said, now, boys, he said, I'm going to chew tobacco. It's a nasty habit, but I'm hooked on it. And this nicotine, I just can't get rid of it. It's, uh, you get cancer of the lip, but I just can't quit it. But he said, I don't want my boys to be this chain around the neck all their lives. And I'm going to whip you just to remind you to leave that stuff alone. And he whipped us pretty good. I remember it hurt. But Bernard never did chew no tobacco. And I didn't chew no tobacco. But one day, you know, we didn't have all this uh, gymnastic equipment. Thomas Tebow said, let's play a kicking game. And he sided up to my brother and said, hey, hey, like a mule, you know, and kicked at it. And it sort of bounced off. Well, you see, Bernard and I had walked or run or trotted two and a half miles to school every day. And we had pretty strong legs. And he hauled off and kicked Thomas DeBoe, and he was flat on the ground. And he raised his hand and said, Brown mule, brown mule, don't kick me again. And from that time on, my brother, Bernard second has been brown mule. And everywhere we played bus ball, Sylvania, Savannah, anywhere, they'd say brown mule and Easter. Well, we had a lot of fun. Uh, and I appreciate what uh, Effingham has done for me educationally. I was uh, president of the senior class and was an honor graduate, but something bothered me. I had a, a friend about my same age. He was a fine fellow, bright, good, honest, hard worker. His name was Joe, Joe Robinson, but he was black. We called him Negroes back then. That was a where you said respect. And we would pick cotton together and went coon hunting some together. And no matter how many bales of cotton we had in the field, September the 1st came, we had to go to school. But guess what? Back when I was a boy, the black school didn't start until about November. The cotton had to be all picked before the nigger children, we call them, would go to school. Well, I knew that wasn't right, and that bothered me. And guess what? The next spring, I went to, uh, you know, to the middle of May. In fact, I graduated from high school on May the 18th, 1935, on my 18th birthday, or May the 20th, on my 18th birthday. But Joe's school had already closed, and they didn't have but one high school, and for blacks in the county, and they couldn't be going to school together. And that was a school over in uh, Guyton that the, the uh, Missionary Baptist Church. But how is a boy from Springfield or Clio going to go over to Guyton? He didn't have one of the boys, really. So Joe didn't have a chance. And that was bad. And I knew it was wrong. But Effingham has done a lot for me. And that's the way we thought back then. But it wasn't right. In spite of the fact that we were Solberger's, uh, it wasn't right. And uh, I'm proud of my county now. Now we are giving everybody a chance. No matter what color the skin, what nationality, where you came from, you can even be a Yankee now and come down here and we'll give you an education if you study. Uh, but I I'm glad we've made some progress but it's been mighty slow. Uh, and uh, I've gotten in trouble a little bit. One time I preached a homecoming service and I tried to talk about the black folks, you know, being uh, human beings. And I said, now that cemetery over there, that big fence in the Springfield Cemetery is kept so good. And that black cemetery was growing up in weeds. And uh, I said, no. Uh, Suppose I want to be buried over in that black cemetery. Would you all take the fence down and so we could go through and then forget to? Well, I know that was a little bit uh, harsh, but man, uh, my nephew got in a fight over it. 
And, uh, uh, you know, that was too radical, but, uh, see, I had had an opportunity to go to school, uh, not at Ember, because you couldn't, black couldn't go to Ember when I was there. But up at Yale Divinity School, some of my best friends, and look at him. Hitler had said that we Aryans are superior races. Well, I've been to school with English people and uh, other people, Japanese people, you know, and I wasn't necessarily superior. So I didn't buy that thing about the white folks being superior. And one of the things that bugged me hard was Marvin Griffin. Back then you ran on being a race, racist, you know, and you keep the niggers in the place. You could let them vote in the general election. Well, that didn't amount to hill of beans. And, uh, but Marvin Griffin started a white citizens council, and he wanted to start it among good people, respectable people. And guess what he put the first one? He came down to Effingham, and among our ancestors, he started a white citizens council, which basically was punching the old thing, the superior of the white people. And uh, the next place he came was to Triplin County, where I was pastor. And some of the people that was involved in organizing asked me if I'd come and say a prayer. And I thought about it a little bit. I said, yes, I'll go say a prayer. I was going, I was going to pray the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, where there was hatred that me so love. And that's what I plan to do. But it wouldn't have set too well in Sopran in 1953. So the Lord delivered me from that confrontation. I had a funeral I had to go to. But folks, we've got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, uh, people are people, and everybody has a chance. And I'm glad to be in America. And I was a Navy chaplain, and I waved the flag. But it's not just the white folks. And the thing that bothered me as a young person, the Salzburgers were ran out of Salzburg because of religious persecution. And we were refugees. We'd been persecuted, and God gave us this place where we could come and uh, worship and raise our families in freedom, and I appreciate it. And I did not appreciate the racist politicians coming down to my home county. And uh, we of all people should be, you know, tolerant, because we were showing mercy. But uh, that sounds like I'm quit preaching and starting to make but isn't it a new day? We, we still got a long way to go. But at least we're making progress. And, uh, and I'm glad. Now, is there anything else? I haven't told you about all of my kin people. Donald and I were such big buddies. Uh, Raymond and I would go duck hunting. And, uh, uh, our, our recreation back then was uh, hunting and fishing and baseball. Well, man, that bearable Braves, uh, I wasn't big enough when the first started going, but Saturday afternoon, Papa finally let us go to the ball game rather than uh, work. And after the ball game, we'd churn a cream of homemade ice cream. And Saturday was almost as good as Sunday. But uh, I finally got where I could play a little ball and they let me play second base because you could bobble the ball and they could run as fast as they can now. You could throw it on the hand and get him out. But the longer I played, I was sort of a late bloomer. My, my brother Bernard was good from the start, but it took a long time to sort of get good. <clears throat> but when I finished high school, Mr. Jack Brownell had the Springfield Athletic Club. It wasn't the big Ravenel, the big Whiteman team. It was us. Younger fellows, Paul Edenfield was on it. Paul was sort of hard-headed, and uh, he would steal third base sometime when the coach had not talked. Mr. Jack would put him on the bench. But, but he, told, he taught me more about baseball. I played center field or left field, and he'd tell us, you back each other up on a line drive, run as hard as you can, scoop it up, and throw it on the hop to home plate, and you'll get him out. 
but in all my college ball, but the longer I played, the, really, the better I got. And uh, that summer after I played in this, uh, Springfield here, we played about eight games, and I had a batting average of about 500, had made a bobble in center field. And uh, and that Scott, all the strange said, the scouts from the Nine Crackers were going to come to the game. We were playing Sabrina that afternoon, and I looked around, I didn't see anybody. First time I got up, man, I was hidden for the temple. And I struck out clean as a whistle. I went to Mr. Jack and said, that scout was always bothering me. Where is he? He said, Ernest, just before the game, he had to go to Savannah, but he said he wants you to keep in touch. Well, next time I got a triple, I think, but, but I could have played professional ball. The scout said, uh, but I, I didn't. I said, I can't prepare to preach and be riding those buses all over the conference. You don't start, you know, on the, uh, the major leagues. You start with the farm team. But I'm, I'm not sorry because in fact, I reckon I ought to go back and say that before I could say yes to God, Miss Annie Knightley, I was kneeling at the camp meeting down there, and she came up and said, Ernest, is there anything between you and God? Well, I didn't tell her, but the Lord knew exactly what it was baseball, because that was God for me. And you know, before I had any peace, I had to promise God, if I never play another game of baseball, you're going to be first. And when I did that, it was sort of a conversion, and it was wonderful. And I've played a lot of baseball since, but it's never been God. I was captain of a team at Young Harris College. Uh, then when I finally got, I had to work my way through the first two years at Emory, when I went back to seminary. I played baseball. I made the old Emory catcher. And now this sounds like bragging, but if you can't throw a ball to second base now, you can tell about what you did do. And that year, <clears throat> I batted 473 for the season. Now, how do you get that sort? I wasn't batting against Nico, I understand, but I could lay down a butt, and I was sort of a slow. And when you nine a line drive at that third base, when he didn't look up, and I would bunt by catching the ball. He would just put my hand up there and catch it. I could start, I could be like this, and Pitch you could start in motion and I could catch the ball. Well, they call them on the butt eight times. And I got seven hits and a sacrifice. And so that's how that average went up like that. But I know I could have played ball, but uh, I played ball after that, but it was never first. And uh, I played for fun. And I really think that's what baseball was designed for, for fun, rather than billion dollar salary. But is there anything else you want me to cover that you think I've neglected? Yeah, I see you have a wedding band on there. Tell me about your family. Well, uh, when I finished uh, the chaplain's training at William and Mary College, uh, man, I had a girl. She was a graduate of Western Conservatory. And man, could she play the piano, and was she pretty? And I got pretty, uh, you know, and I even invited her to come up to William and Mary, where I was graduating, and she came up and rode the train. In the meantime, I had bought a ring, and I gave that girl the ring, and I spent several days with her, but uh, she was pretty, but I just kissed her one time and the lips were sort of cold. But I figured they'd warm up, you know. And I went on out to uh, Mare Island Navy Yard waiting for my ship. In two weeks, I hadn't heard from Martha. So I called her up, and her mother answered the phone. I said, now, can I speak to Martha? She said, she's not here. I said, well, when will she be back? She said, in about a week. I said, well, where is she? She said, she's on a honeymoon. I said, what? <laughs> She's on the honeymoon. And in about a week, I got a letter from her, and she said that her high school sweetheart had come back from the Marine, Marines and swept her off her feet. And she returned the ring. And the tragedy was that the marriage lasted only about two weeks. But I never did look back, because at that time, a divorced preacher, you couldn't wear a divorced woman to be a preacher. But uh, I never saw her. 
but I said, Lord, and I got to be a little bit woman shy. Is that the right word? Mm -hmm. Woman shy. <laughs> and so I went to Shanghai and I bought some beautiful silk. And I didn't know what size my wife was going to be. But I said, this is going to be for my wife. And I bought some silk enough to make a dress, I thought. And I said, this isn't going to nobody but my wife. And I prayed that the Lord would show me the right person or uh, the right person would find me. And he did. Jesse Vanderson was the uh, dietitian at Camel Hospital. And I was a chaplain. And guess what? She was Baptist, but that wasn't too bad. I'd rather have been Methodist. But uh, she would get up at 5 o'clock Sunday morning and come down to Camel Hospital and get Sunday dinner ready. She didn't have to do it, but she had to see that it was done. And get everything ready. And then she'd go to the First Baptist Church where Bruce, uh, what was the name of WTOC? Dwight Bruce. Dwight Bruce. Dwight Bruce. He was the choir director. Man, she liked it. She'd sing in the choir. And I looked at that girl. The assistant dietitian was really a more immediately appealing. And uh, Jesse could hardly keep her on the job. She'd bring me special stuff, you know. But then she was just an intern for the summer, and she went on back to school. And I got to look into that Jessie. I said, that girl must have character. And I sort of fell in love with the first through my mind. I said, now that's a fine girl. But I hadn't thought about dating. But one time, uh, we went on a, a party together over to Bluffton. And they got me a blind date. I didn't know, but she was all right. We weren't doing much, you know, just playing. But they didn't know what to do. So I'd been a recreation director in the youth camps and so on. Now, at that time, a Methodist couldn't dance. But we didn't call it uh, uh, dancing. It was folk games, not folk dances. And so I showed them how to play folk games. And we had a big time. Well, sometime during the evening, uh, I split my coat or pants or something. You know, I had on my, uh, I think I wore my opposite uniform and I'd grown it and sort of split. And, uh, and Jesse slipped up to me and said, they can't see it, but you've got to split this. They said, if you will bring me those pants tomorrow, I'll, I'll fix them for you. And she did. And we started going. And her father, they had a place out on, uh, of the island that Claude Fallagher bought. It was Scribbled Island, but he named it Tulehi Island, because you can't sell lots on Scribbled Island. But Tulehi was in his name. But they had a place. And every Sunday, I'd go out for Sunday dinner. And man, did they have good chicken. And did I eat a lot. And um, I liked, we liked to broke up because she fell in the water one time out there in that river. And I'd been a, I had been a, a lifeguard, Red Cross and all, and they told us the last thing you do is go in after them. You give them something, and, but don't you go in after them to drown. Well, I reached out and I helped to get up, but I didn't go in after them. She thought I should have just dived in there and rescued her, but I didn't. But what almost broke it up, I took a coon hunting. And uh, we had a brown dog, a uh, dog named Brownie, and he treed. And man, when a dog trees, you got to go. And I went to the tree, and she says I left her in the briars. The next day she came to work, had a little scar, but she, people kicked about it. But I explained to her, I said, honey, when the dog trees, we got to go. So the next time he treed, I held her by the hand, and we went. But we finally got, and she had made the most wonderful life I've ever had. Took the best dietitian Candle Hospital I've ever had, made the best wife, and we've been married 52 years. And we've got a wonderful family. Ernest Junior, we born at Candle Hospital. And we were born, she started twisting her arm. Could you name him Ernest Junior? She got his form, and I said, that'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, then the next one came was Andy. And each one of them were fine, all of them finished college, and only one of them had a debt. David was the third, he's a musician. Andy got a master's degree in uh, uh, agriculture, or what you call it, uh, uh, 
what do they call it when you doctor plants or, or bugs? A bugs. Uh, Entomologist. Entomologist. That's what he made. It. And uh, he got a job, and he's making big money in agriculture. He's nearly got enough money. He's he's almost Republican now. <laughs> and uh, uh, my, my youngest son uh, is uh, he went to Georgia Tech, and, and he's making a big enough money. He leaned pretty heavy in that direction, because if you got money, you can keep it better if you're Republican. But I'm gonna quit preaching now, that would, because you're all probably registered Republican. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, uh, we had three boys living at Sophia. And we thought surely this would be a girl, you know, the, the Ernest Jr. and Andy, living at Sophia. They were building a new hospital, and they wanted to give a layout for the next baby, you know. And everybody gave us pink stuff. And here came that little boy. And uh, somebody asked Ernest Jr., what's you going to name him? And he said, name him Tim. Well, he meant Timmy the Turtle, but we saw Timothy was a good name. Uh, but, uh, you know, second is about that long. And if you put a long first name on it, it won't get on the page. So we and said, I didn't like the next names I'd had, and I wanted them. But we looked up in the Bible and the dictionary to it, and David means beloved. I said, honey, let's name him David. Uh, let's name him David, because at least he will know if all Trudeland County wanted a girl that we wanted. Him. So we named him David Timothy. But he said he's had a little trouble with DTs <laughs> after that. But, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, we were going to the hospital uh, early in the morning and in Soperton. It was going to be the first one, you know, born in the hospital. We thought we got there before anybody else. And we hadn't been there long before this fella came in. He was all nervous. And the doctor looked at his wife and said, Brother Ernest, she said, uh, she got the most of this and she's going to be first. So twin boys were born, and I had to sort of console and counsel that fellow. Well, I had good experience with it because when I was chaplain, the uh, father's waiting room was right there close to where my office was. And I'd put my arm around him and I'd console him. I said, well, we haven't lost a father yet. But when I would walk on the floor for Ernest Jr., that was the dumbest thing I've ever said. But I had to counsel him. And uh, they were so shocked, they didn't know it was going to be twins. And, uh, and we were thinking about what we were going to name David. And they were so shocked, they hadn't named that children. About a day and a half or so, the nurses took the situation in hand. And they said, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. <laughs> uh, but, but we finally named them. And then finally, Sugar Plum, I call her, Charlotte, came along prettiest little thing you've ever seen. And man, were we proud. We started to name her Amelia, of course, four children were about enough, you know, but we didn't. And, but we were proud of that little girl. I mean, she's the prettiest